is a sanctuary where the greatest collection of Australian native birds and animal surroundings is a perpetual attraction for visitors. The sanctuary is named after a famous professor of anatomy and lover of our native fauna, the late Sir Colin Mackenzie. Running through it is Badger Creek, so named by early settlers who thought the wombat was a badger. Second largest living bird, the emu. They roam around eating anything from beer bottle tops to stones and take visitors lunches if they can. After laying the eggs, the mother just strolls away and does nothing else but feed, boom and show off. The father emu is really the mother. That is to say, he incubates the eggs for two months and then looks after the chicks. Emu eggs weigh about a pound and a half, and a really big one is equivalent to about a dozen hen's eggs. After Dad breastbone, while Mum goes to the pictures and the bridge club, his little football team arrives. Don't you like their striped jersey? Dad mounts a guard at the ready until the team takes the field. Dinner is now served, and the diners are mostly wallabies, which are a sort of junior kangaroo. The black-tailed wallaby is common in the hills and fern gullies of Victorian bush country. These kangaroos are the females of the grey and the black-faced species. Parry wallabies from Queensland are exceptionally speedy and having very long tails, are sometimes also called long tail. More commonly, they are known as pretty faces and are our loveliest wallabies. It certainly must have been lunchtime. Small wallabies, not much larger than hares, are grouped under the name of paddy melons. One seen here has a baby half as big as itself. Getting home is such a tight squeeze that the shoehorn seems indicated. Ah, made it. Though grass eaters in the wild state, kangaroos and wallabies reared in a fauna reserve develop a great liking for sweets, chocolates, biscuits and peanuts. No, no more. Joey wallabies and kangaroos are only about half an inch long when born and after entering the pouch, spend up to six months in its shelter. friends together and very much at home among friends in this perfect natural setting are two very interesting corroboree birds. Brogus on their companions are large Australian cranes that dance very cleverly. On the swamps and plains they indulge in this dance sometimes in large parties of 20 or 30. They throw sticks in the air, bow and scrape to one another and occasionally fly to great heights. The Brogus dance is both stately and grotesque and strange to say not one Australian in 10,000 has ever seen it. Now for the pride and the pets of the sanctuary. In fact, the best loved animal in Australia, our koala or native bear. There are 50 of his tribe in the Sir Colin Mackenzie Sanctuary and they live in their own beloved gums. The koala is also only about half an inch long when born and spends four months in its mother's pouch. This joey is starting to get about a bit Hold on, Junior. Mother's just going to have a nibble of afternoon tea. This is venison on the hoof. Strictly speaking, they're intruders into the sanctuary because Australia has no native deer. Only the descendants of imported fallow deer and samba, hog deer and even axis deer from Japan. In some parts of Victoria, they're a pest and there's no close season anywhere for them. But here, they are privileged and protected pets. There's a bird at every zoo called a pelican, whose bill holds more than its, yes, you know the rest of the rhyme, steamboat bill and tugboat anning on naval manoeuvres. Waterfowl seem to know that no artillery is allowed, 
But when they arrive, they often send out telegrams to invite their friends and their friends' friends too. Black swans, ibis, spoonbills and coots, such as inspired C.J. Dennis, our great bush poet, to write, Fellows of Australia, blokes and coves and coots. Here's a rare magpie goose doing a stretch and these handsome mountain ducks or sheldrakes and the cassowary which is a sort of Australian ostrich but otherwise like nothing on earth. Note its fairy feet and crash helmet. The Tasmanian devil carries four babies in its pouch and likes its mutton alive. It's an amazing marsupial and smells as strong as it looks. Australia's zoological curiosity, the duckbill platypus, is a major attraction at the sanctuary being nocturnal and highly temperamental, a platypus cannot be shown in safety to itself more than once a day. Earthworms, tadpoles and yabbies are its diet. This is the platypus's first cousin. Commonly but incorrectly called a porcupine, it's really the spiny anteater and it has a well-developed pouch which is not the case in its egg-laying cousin, the platypus. Hey, stop picking at him, you fellows. Nothing puts an emu off, not even a spiny anteater's spines. He's a real Australian digger. Not Myrtle the turtle, but Tom the long-necked river tortoise. In swamps or billabongs, he loves hot, sizzling days. The white-breasted sea eagle is the handsomest of his kind. Horatius, a very large wedge-tailed eagle, has been trained in the ancient sport of falconry. He's over seven feet across the wings and he can be safely released to fly after rabbits in the paddocks without fear of losing him. His aerial antics, including power dives, rolls and are a sight to behold. Said to be the only fetch and carry eagle in captivity. These are the heavyweight champions of bushland. The woeful wombat, whom nobody loves. Bob the dingo, or wild dog, comes from the Gulf country of northern Queensland. And here's another famous Queenslander, the brush or mound building turkey. Cockbirds scratch up huge mounds weighing tons, measuring over six feet in height and 16 feet in diameter. The hen bird lays the eggs in this natural incubator and father regularly tests the mound for internal temperature. Mr. Brush Turkey, like the emu and cassowary, is one of nature's gentlemen and does all his wife's work as well as his own. Largest of the possum family is this handsome Tasmanian black. He has, unfortunately for him, a magnificent fur coat. Lizards and snakes dwell in open air parks in the sanctuary. These small frill neck lizards look ferocious, but are really quite harmless. The six foot lizards are known as goannas, and iguana, these flesh. This one weighs 45 pounds and is the old, grand old man of the goannery. Eggs are very much relished and are usually swallowed whole tongue is long and forked. Yes, Australia is rich in reptiles, though some of us think that rich is hardly the word. They include some of the world's deadliest snakes and a lot of harmless ones. Cemeteries are full of people who couldn't tell the difference. This prehistoric looking dragon might be a distant relative of the one St. George slew. Here's a really decent tangled mass of poison, mostly tiger snakes whose venom is the most potent of any land snake in the world. Fortunately, its biting apparatus is not very efficient, its fangs being very small. Copperhead's another deadly snake, very much at home in the rockery. These chaps seem a little annoyed about something. Here's a snake charmer who's a little genius with the reptiles. This North Queensland python you'll be glad to hear is harmless. Perhaps the rarest of his reptile pets, however, is the green tree snake from the north of Australia that he sends for a stroll in the treetops. Although he's non-venomous, he's put me off bird nesting, in the north anyway. Good look around before going aloft, and away we go.
See, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. The true frill lizard of North Australia has an Elizabethan ruff around its neck and a healthy dislike for the green tree snake. Anything's likely to happen here, and it does. White heron-like birds are the plumed egrets noted for their beautiful plumes. The Major Mitchell is the most beautiful of all our cockatoos and has a glorious crest. He's a mallee dweller and to see a large flock rise pink against the setting sun is a sight never to be forgotten. Bitterns or bunyips are past masters of camouflage. Aborigines build legends of the bunyip around the booming voice of this bird, heard in the reed beds at night. The Australian king parrot is the largest and most colourful of native parrots. Usually a flock of a hundred or more is to be seen feeding in the kangaroo troughs in the sanctuary. The brilliant scarlet head and breast and light green band on the wings make the male bird much more colourful than the green-headed hen. But he thinks a lot of it just the same. And, of course, you all know the Boo Book Owl and the Kookaburra. Now we come to the fighting grey kangaroo. Over six feet in his socks, packing your wicked punch. And the monarch of all he surveys. Well, almost. That one's a red roo, which takes a look at the grey and hops it. Great champion will fight anything that enters his paddock. When he tackles this dummy, you see the kangaroo technique in a sort of... It's all in go. Watch those powerful hind legs. No rules here about kicking under the belt. a workout to keep in form. Hey, what's this duck doing in with the man-killer? I beg your pardon, that's a Cape Baron gander that must have heard the story of David and Goliath. They say the best defence is attack, but things look bad now. He can't get out of it. He can't get out of it. He's out of it. The champ's on the run. That'll show you. Finding food for lyrebirds is a whole time job. Worms, grubs, beetles and termites must be found each day in thousands. So it's just as well there's no strike at this grub factory. The lyrebird is the world's greatest mockingbird. When held at the trail, the tail of the male bird cannot be properly seen. But in the winter time, he displays his tail as he holds his world famous concerts. These birds are shown rearing a foster child. Both the adult birds are rescued from bushfires, one being found with its tail burnt right off. This is really a remarkable glimpse of the lyrebird family at dinner, something that very few Australians have seen in bushland. And here's an excellent view of the lyrate feathers from which the bird derives its name. Native cats are small cousins of Tasmanian devils, and unfortunately they've almost disappeared from the mainland. The tiger cat is a slightly larger species. Actually, neither animal has any relation to a cat, but still bears names bestowed on them by early colonists. And here's the curious tree kangaroo. Note the foreshortened front legs. At night, the possums move about feeding on the leaves of the trees. These possums were very uncertain about the bright light in which they are filmed. The ordinary silver grey possum is practically the only native animal that has been able to adapt itself successfully to the changed conditions of civilization and settlement. We often find them in our parks and gardens. This native cat was looking for the last train home. While the ghostly barn owls weren't very much put out, probably just didn't give a hoot. And here are the picturesque little flying squirrels, or pygmy phalanges, which parachute from tree to tree and are the daintiest of creatures. 
They live in old hog gum trees and feed on nectar and insects. Other interesting bush creatures of the night are the ring-tailed possum, who treats us to a climbing display and doesn't seem a bit surprised to see us. And the quaint little rose rat kangaroo, the smallest and possibly to photograph anyway. But perhaps the most fantastic creature of all the possum family is the cuscus, a tropical and rather lazy visitor from New Guinea and North Queensland. The New Guinea natives are very fond of him. Yes, in a pot. This brings to a close our ramble in bushland, where in the lovely setting of this sanctuary, Australians young and old learn to have a new regard and closer affection for all these Alice in Wonderland creatures. <laughs>